And it is also my great privilege to uh, introduce our speaker this morning. Um, most of you, a lot of you know <clears throat> um, Elizabeth she, from the worship that she's done here. Uh, but Elizabeth is also she, well, obviously a songwriter. Uh, she's a poet. She's leading a group of, of prophets in, po in creativity in the earth. Um, she's a, a wife. She's a farmer. <laughs> She's got a couple of acres of property in Chehalis. They may have they produce amazing tomatoes and cucumbers and all that stuff. Um, she's just an overall amazing woman. Would you help me welcome Elizabeth Cooper this morning? So we're going to pray. Just extend your hands. Uh, Darren has dubbed her the Mighty Cooper. So, uh, so Father, we agree with the Mighty Cooper this morning. We thank you for just an ease, Lord. We thank you for an ease uh, and, and fun this morning, God, as she releases what's on your heart. We thank you for this oracle in this earth. We thank you for this prophet in the earth. Lord, we, we do receive this gift amongst us this morning. We're thankful for her, Father. We speak blessing and life. And, uh, Lord, we just thank you for that impartation the spirit of revelation uh, landing upon each and every one of us this morning, God, that we would take in all that it is that she's, uh, that you have given her and she's releasing to you. And we bless her in Jesus' name. Amen. This, you might want that other microphone. This one's a little... Excuse us. We need to change mics. Awesome. Good morning. How's everybody this morning? <clears throat> Ready to roll, huh? Okay. I didn't see the hands. How many were at the Renko conference? Oh, lots of you. Yay. Awesome. Yeah. <clears throat> I had to represent this morning. I also have been conferencing all weekend, so you weren't really going to catch me in anything but a hoodie this morning. <laughs> Although I don't need much of an excuse, so. Oh, my goodness. I've never spoken services back to back before, same message. It's not really my style. Uh, for those of you who have been in my worship, you know I probably never sing the same thing twice the same way. And I never preach anything twice the same way either, so we don't know what's going to happen this morning. <laughs> uh, it's just really important that we actually um, learn to move with the rhythm of his heart. And, you know, in these, the, the culture of, you know, charismatic two services, three services, whatever we do, um, it's really important that we keep in mind that you all are here in this service, and there were other people here in the other service, and the Holy Spirit is, does very specific things at very specific times. And so when we move with the rhythm of his heart and we allow him to actually just breathe and maybe do something different because the tapestry that is being woven in this moment is different than what was at 9 a.m. You know what I mean? And that's just a really important thing to keep in, in, in our minds, just in life in general. As we do things that maybe we're in a habit of doing, or, um, you know, we do some of the same things every day, um, that we really learn to um, walk in a place of union with the heart of the Lord um, and move with the rhythm of his heart in that.
that isn't what I'm talking about today. <laughs> We're going to go on lots of bunny trails, I can feel it. We did in the first service too, but it was, it, it, they'll be different, I'm sure. You know, we, we are in a, a new era. We've stepped into a new era. And there is a clarion call for culture creators in this time. There is a clarion call for city builders in this time. And I know that Darren has been talking about Epcot, and there's been more talk about that. And that language and those thoughts and those ideas are just going to continue to bubble up in the the ecclesia the rising governing body of Christ you're going to hear that theme you're going to um, there may be few talking about it now but let me tell you we're coming into some real places of um, uh, what I like to call critical mass. When you have enough to combust, when you gather enough matter that it actually, it spreads, it, it is. So there are many things in the earth right now that the Lord is doing in this new era. And it may be new language to some of you. And it may be new thoughts and new concepts and new ideas. Um, let me assure you, it, they're not actually new. Um, these thoughts that are from the heart of the Lord are what I have been calling the new and ancient way. They're new to us. They might be new to us, but they're ancient in the heart of the Lord. And so there are these things that are sort of bubbling up in the earth and you're, you're hearing about some of this stuff in the movements and union is one of those things. We are hearing a lot of people um, sort of in, in the mystic circles talking about this and um, and a few years ago I, I released a prophetic word that said we are about to hit critical mass in these specific things in the earth because the Lord is just raising raising up his ecclesia in the earth Amen. it's really it's time for us to govern once again And that, that, that doesn't mean that it's time for the pastors to govern. The leadership to govern. Now, okay, I'm not saying, like, I'll be rebellious. I'm, I have to be careful what I say. I know, you, I think you guys can understand my heart and sometimes not my words, right? <laughs> I believe in clarity, but I also believe that uh, there is a, a transference of truth in um, the frequency of the Holy Spirit. Right. Right. So, <clears throat> it's time for you to govern. Amen. The Lord is looking for you. He's calling for you. And one of the things that the Lord is doing is he's, he's breaking the, the, the man-made systems of religion in this hour. Because the Western church has taken hold of and perpetuated a bunch of Babylonian stuff. And so the Lord is calling culture creators. He's calling city builders. He's calling you. He's calling the ecclesia to 
build according to the pattern that he shows you on the mountain. Build according to the pattern that he shows us on the mountain. Build according to the patterns of Zion. Now, I always say this. The patterns of Zion are unassuming. The, the ways and the weapons of Zion are unassuming, but they win. And they're directly opposed to Babylon. And what we're seeing in the earth is Babylonian systems crumbling everywhere. They're crumbling everywhere. They're not just crumbling in the culture of the, the world. They're crumbling, crumbling in the culture of the church. And amen. Yes, and amen. Because they have to come down in order for us to build according to the pattern that he showed us on the mountain. In order to build something new, you have to think new thoughts. In order to build something new, you have to do new things. In order to build something new, you have to become aware of what you have been unaware of. And we've just, there's so much talk about building new things, doing new things, revolutionaries, ah, you know? And I've been, I like, look, I'm a revolutionary at heart. It is who I am. I am here to revolutionize. Yeah. Amen. <laughs> but in order to do that, we actually have to do something different. Which means it's a little chaotic. Right? It's like, it's a little uncomfortable. It's a little awkward. It's a little, what's going on? What am I supposed to do? What am I supposed to believe? Because the system that I actually leaned on is no longer viable. So 10 years ago about, the Lord spoke to me. He spoke a word and, and he said, and this was for the church, like worldwide, Shift or be sifted. And that, when he told me that, I was like, whoa, like, okay, unpack this for me. Explain this to me. Like, I, I think I, I've got it, but that's a, that's a pretty heavy, heavy deal, right? So he began to speak to me about sifting systems and that what we have mostly built the Western church on is man's good ideas instead of standing in the counsel of the Lord. And he began to speak to me that if, if the church does not shift to become the ecclesia, to come in and build according to the pattern that he shows us on the mountain, to build according to the ways and the patterns of his heart and Zion, that our organizations, if you will, uh, will, will become, they, they won't be viable. We will not hold power. We will not hold authority. And that is a very serious thing. Now, we're actually seeing that happen. We are actually presently in the shifting and the sifting. And so we have choices to make. And some of them are going to be hard choices. And I just want to talk to you, SRC, for a minute. Because you push the envelope. You always have, you always will. And I love that about you. And the Lord loves that about you. But in the coming moments, I'll say, of what the Lord is doing on the earth, there may be times where it could be a challenge and you're going to say, you want us to do what? <laughs> you want us to build what? You want us to quit what? You want us to start 
what. And you, SRC, need to be ready to turn on a dime. Because there is reward for you. Because the Lord loves your heart and he loves you so very much. Because you have followed him, because you have obeyed him, you have an opportunity that few have coming into this next era. We're actually present, presently in it, but we're still coming into it. There's a lot of transition happening. But this is a really exciting time. A really exciting time on the earth. And, you know, there's, there's uh, a lot of chaos happening in the systems of the world. And, and like I said, you know, these Babylonian systems, they are coming down. They've actually already been defeated. It's already been done. We're just seeing the, the manifestation of it, right? It's already been done. It's done. Babylon is fallen. You know, it's... But in the chaos, there is possibility for everything. And that is very exciting. That is what the God of Genesis would call a great opportunity for something beautiful. Because in Genesis, where it says that everything was void, everything was, that, that, that word, that Hebrew word is tohu bohu, and it just means this primordial chaos and darkness and swirling, and, and there's just all the, but in that alchemized with the word of God is everything required to create anything. Come on. So culture creators, city builders, what does this look like? Culture creators. Now, I, I use the word culture creators and not culture influencers. Um, I have departed from that term. I, I don't like it. I don't think we should use it in the church. I think it has led us astray. Uh, it's too tied to the earth's systems and ways of thinking. The Lord does not think in terms of influence. He thinks in terms of creation and authority. So we've, we've kind of, what we've done kind of up till now is we've looked at what's happening in the world and we've looked at the trends and we've looked at the aesthetics and we've looked at what do people like and what do we do, hashtag this, woo woo woo, okay? And we build according to that. We kind of adopt it and regurgitate it and we're still 10 years behind, I'm sorry to say. And we, but we do that in order to sort of get our foot in the door. This is our sort of like our, our strategy. Like to get our foot in the door so that we can gain some semblance of influence with people and get them to come and come to us. You know, it's, it's, it, it, instead of actually 
standing in the counsel of the Lord and realizing that we are Zion people and I'm in the mountain and the mountain is in me and I build according to the patterns that he showed me on the mountain that I build according to the ways and the weapons of Zion. So the ways and the weapons of Zion, just a little, you know, I'm not going to do a whole thing on this, but, um, they win. What do they look like? What are they? Some of the cornerstones of Zion. Beauty is one. Rest is another. Joy is another. And then Yeshua himself is another. And those things don't seem very like, rah, we're going to win. They just, they don't, right? They don't kind of like <laughs> give you that, that feeling. But his ways are not our ways. And his thoughts are higher than ours. And... So these things win, and um, and these are the these are the things that we need to build upon. These are the things that we need to be walking in as culture creators. And it's totally it's totally counterculture to to everything that's going on, and it's totally counterculture to actually most of the church. So, you know, therein lies a little bit of challenge for us if we're going to do this thing, right? But the courage of the Lord is a very beautiful thing. And I can feel the pleasure of the Lord's heart over you, SRC. And I can sense the courage of the Lord rising up in your spirits. And I can sense the Genesis, the God of Genesis hovering over all of this chaos and all of this stuff and going, I'm going to build a city with these people. The Lord is a city builder. Have you read about the New Jerusalem? It is very beautiful. I love to just uh, read and meditate and, and, and gaze on the beauty of the Lord, who he is, but what he creates. And when I read about what he creates... You know, the tabernacle, the, the new Jerusalem, this whole wide world and all the cosmos. It, it does something to me, and, and it, it shows us that the Lord values beauty, and that beauty is actually first and foremost in his heart and in his thoughts and, and, and in everything that he creates. The, the word for um, good in Genesis when he says, and it, it is good, the Lord said it's good, actually is a Hebrew word that can be translated beautiful. And so the first time that we actually see the Lord sit back and we get a glimpse into how does he feel about all of this? The first time he's talking about beauty. And so often in the church, this actually isn't my part of my preach either, but... Um, 
So often in the, the church, we beauty is our last word. It's relegated to an extra, and it's relegated to an extra in, in most realms of society um, as well, you know, in terms of the arts and, and whatever. You know, you have those people who value it, but you, it, we don't see it as a, a first and foremost. But the Lord leads with beauty. And so if we are going to actually uh, be city builders, if we're going to actually be build according to the pattern that he showed us on the mountain, then we're going to have to come into this place like David. He said, one thing have I desired of the Lord, and that's the thing that I'm going to seek after, to dwell in the house of the Lord, to dwell in the heart of the Lord, and to gaze upon your beauty and to inquire in your temple all of my days. And then my head is going to be lifted up from all my enemies. And you're going to save me. You're going to bring me into your shelter. And so we see that there is actually, um, a, that beauty protects. Because when you come into the beauty realm, darkness does not follow you there. It cannot follow you there. And we, um, there's some paradigm shifts that are going to have to take place in terms of warfare, and what we do and how we approach that if we're going to build according to the pattern that he showed us on the mountain. Because who would have thought that beauty could be one of the greatest weapons of protection and victory that we could possess? David, I'm just gazing on your beauty. David was a gazer on beauty. Oh, he just loved the beauty of the Lord. You read the Psalms and, oh, I love David. I, I, I love David. And, and he valued beauty. He co-labored with the Lord for beauty in the earth. Um, and he, he understood. He understood the nature of beauty and what beauty does and how it protects. I mean, the juxtaposition of that, you know, I'm just, I'm gazing on your beauty and then it talks about all of these ways that David is protected and that he's lifted up from his enemies. And it truly is because darkness cannot follow you into the beauty realm. It cannot. It, it has to do, it's actually connected with wisdom and the highway of holiness. Because um, wisdom in, in um, I think it's Proverbs 8, and then Job, do not quote me on this, I think it's 28. I could be wrong. Um, I get my references all, all crazy. So, um, But they talk about wisdom they talk about and Isaiah talks about the highway of holiness it's very interesting uh, to look at these scriptures um, side by side because they it uses the same exact language it says the the place where no bird of prey knows and the wild beasts have not trod there so there's a place of protection. There's a place above the snake line in the realm of wisdom and on the highway of holiness, which I would say new and ancient way. And wisdom is a creator, right? Wisdom is an artisan. Wisdom loves beauty. Wisdom was there beside him as a skilled craftsman. As he created and rejoiced and, and just joyed in, in the beauty of creation. And so there's this sort of trifecta thing with beauty and wisdom and the highway of holiness that we really need to get a hold of in the church um, as people who live an ascended life above the systems of the world in order to create cities within cities in order to until the kingdoms of this world become the kingdoms of our God and King, right? 
So this is really, these are strategies, but not only strategies, they're, they are the ancient way of the heart. That we must come into and really start to break off the old mindsets of what does warfare look like. I'm going to do this. So I'm going to keep going on beauty for a minute. Is that okay, guys? I'm not, I haven't even hit my, I haven't even hit my preach yet. (laughs) We're just changing it up. It's all good. Psalm 45. I was reading, Psalm 45 is one of my absolute favorites. I've read it a million times. Um, Psalm 50 is also a favorite. I've read it a million times. I was reading one day, and um, and I'm just kind of reading through, through, through. So I read Psalm 45, continue to read, turn the page, read Psalm 50, and I noticed the pattern. And I want to show that to you today. Psalm 45, my heart overflows with a beautiful theme. I address my composition to the king. My tongue is like the pen of a ready writer. Side note, that word there, uh, my heart overflows with a beautiful theme. That is the same Hebrew word as in Genesis when the Lord said it is beautiful. Isn't that interesting? We could unpack that for a little bit, but we're going we're gonna to keep going. You are fairer than the sons of men. Grace is poured upon your lips. Therefore, God has blessed you forever. Gird your sword upon your thigh, O mighty one, in your glory and your majesty, and in your majesty ride on triumphantly for the cause of truth, humility, and righteousness, uprightness and right standing with God, and let your right hand guide you to tremendous things. Your arrows are sharp. The people fall under you. Your darts pierce the hearts of the king's enemies. It goes on to say, your throne, O God, is forever and ever and ever. And it's just like this whole thing, right? We turn over to Psalm 50 here. It says, The mighty one God, the Lord, speaks and calls the earth from the rising of the sun to its setting. Out of Zion, the perfection of beauty, God shines forth. Our God comes and does not keep silence. A fire devours before him, and round about him a mighty tempest rages. He calls the heavens above and to the earth that he may judge his people. And it goes on. Now, What I noticed here is the pattern of we have beauty preceding justice. Once I realized this, I started seeing it as a pattern in more places. But this was just like the most concentrated thing that I could look at how these psalms turn. We've got my heart overflows with a beautiful theme. And it's just like, oh, you're fairer than the sons of men. Gird your sword upon your thigh, O oh mighty one, and ride on triumphantly for the cause of truth and righteousness and justice forever, you know? And then out of Zion, the perfection of beauty, our God comes and he does not keep silence. A fire goes before him and devours all his enemies. Like, what? okay, what a weird turn. What is justice? Justice is making all of the wrong things right and all of the dark things light. What is judgment? The relationship between judgment, justice, and love is this. Love fuels every single thing that he does. Ever, ever, ever. It cannot, nothing he does could ever be separated from his love. God is not fragmented. And we... Okay, I'm not going to get into that right now. Um, God is not fragmented. And so everything he does springs out of this, this love. What happens in a courtroom? Gavel goes down. Judgment is pronounced. Justice is served. So, so many times in the church, we have these ideas about, uh, we just... We're confused about who God is and what he does because we've not understood how to live in a paradox. And we have to understand paradoxical living if we're going to be 
living in the kingdom. Right? Uh, if you do not first understand the heart of the Lord, the discrepancy between two seemingly opposing truths will break your faith. Because you will come into doubt and confusion about who God is, what he does, and what he's going to do. And so it's very important in this time that we actually understand the heart of the Lord. And then we can come into the place of the psalmist that said, My heart breaks with longing for your judgments at all times. I have meditated on that scripture, and when I first started meditating on that scripture, I mean, years, lots of years of my life, I, I mean, I have pursued an understanding of justice in the earth, and I was confused by it, and I imagine that so many people are confused by judgment and, and justice, and what is all of this, you know, and where are we, and what's happening, and we've had so much really just crappy eschatology just floating around. It's so anyway, I don't pretend to understand it all, but I know who God is. And that's the place that we need to come into. So, you know, when I first started meditating on the scripture, I was like, Lord, why is the psalmist saying, my heart breaks with longing for your judgments? That doesn't really seem like, like it feels very good to me. Because I grew up like with that Thief in the Night movie. Did anybody see that? I had thing terrified me. <laughs> I'm telling you, I'm not, I'm not joking. I, I practically had to get delivered from that movie, okay? That was... Uh, a horrible thing. Anyway, um, but again, the thing about judgment is that it isn't actually separated from his love, and it's not separated from justice. And justice is always restorative. You know, the, the, the greatest act of judgment and justice released on the earth was the cross, and what did that do for us? Life and immortality. Wholeness, healing. Bought for us. Perfect, seamless, oneness. Bought for us a life where our reality is that we are in complete union with him. You may not feel that way, uh, but that is your reality. Uh, we're seated with Christ in heavenly places. That is our reality. There are these realities that we allow our experience, our natural experience to discount. But here's what I want to, I want to try to bring some clarity to this today. Um, because I'm sure you guys hear a lot about people, um, and I know Sandy and Patty, they, they talk about this. And, you know, Justin, you've had people come in and, uh, talking about union, and it is one of those things. It's, good, it's about to critical mass in the earth, you know. Amen. And here's the reason why it's about to critical mass in the earth. It's because it's the new wineskin of this era that actually is propelling us forward in what we think of as revival. But it's actually what the Lord is doing is he's, bring, he's, he's, he's raising up an ecclesia and he's actually bringing in and raising up sons who are awakened and aware of their union with his heart, seamless oneness. It's the reality. It's the reality. So, so what do we do with the discrepancy, right? What do we do with... I, if I was living in complete union right now, all of me, every cell of my body, I mean, it would look different. I'm just saying, right? 
every moment. It would look different. Our lives would look very, very different. So what do we do with the discrepancy? What, um, our model has been, which I'm not saying this in condemnation, okay? You know, this is, we're in a process and the Lord has brought us through ages and he's brought us through movements and he has accomplished what he wants to accomplish on the earth and bring us further. The issue with getting stuck in an old move or trying to recreate it or actually just hearkening back to want that thing again is that you prohibit yourself from actually moving forward into what God is wanting to do. In order to build something new, we have to think a new thought. In order to do something new, we have to do something different. So there's this, this thing that the Lord is like, okay, I need you to just shift your perspective just a little. I need you to just tweak it just a little bit. Just, a, just, you're almost there. Like church, we're, we're getting there. But Can you imagine the world? Can you imagine the earth where every Christian, every lover of God walked in the reality, walked in the awakening and awareness of their union with Christ, their union with the Father in every moment, of every day. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine that for just a minute? Now, I, I'm just going to venture to say that that would blow every revival that we have ever seen out of the water. It would put them all like, come on. Because we compartmentalize revival. It's been our paradigm. And the Lord is saying no more. Not in the new era. I'm calling you out of compartmentalization. If you want to forge forward into the new, you've got to break the boxes of compartmentalization. Let the Lord break the boxes. We think Greco-Roman. We think linear. We think time. We think segments. And the Lord thinks circular. That's the Hebraic way. Okay, we're coming back to the new and ancient way. So can you imagine this, right? This is maybe a new thought for some of you. It's okay. It's okay. It's okay. So how do we get there? Right? We hear people talk about union. You're hearing it more. But it's like, okay, the reality of the situation is I... It's not manifesting in my life. So our paradigm has been to cry out for more. Cry out for more of God. The problem with that is he's already all up in you. Amen. <laughs> yes. the, the problem with that is you can't have more of him than you already have been given and it is already there. And that is the highest reality. The issue is and the disconnect is... We haven't come into the awakening and the awareness of it. It's there. It's totally there, you guys. But it's just, that's the missing piece, is the awakening and the awareness. So that's, that is, like I, like I said, little tweaks. That's the, the, the practice of union. The practice of union looks like awakening and awareness to that reality and realizing that that is the reality. Like Jesus prayed in John 17, Father, I'm in you and they're in me. There could be this seamless oneness. Our lives, this is how Jesus lived his life in union with the Father. And this is how so many heroes of the faith lived their life. I talked about John G. Lake in the first service, and, you know, we, we, um, we honor him, and, um, and that is right to do. Uh, but 
again, there's just a little bit of shifting that needs to happen because um, I actually had never heard this of all the people I've heard talk about John G. Lake. And I've been in, I grew up four square, um, you know, I've been in the charismatic, I've heard people talk all about these guys, right? All my life. Never once have I heard what I stumbled upon on one, in one of his writings. And what was he talking about? He was talking about union. And to me, that's, that's, that's uh, an issue that we need to address. Because what we call honor has actually turned to idolization of fruit instead of a connection with the Father that made the fruit possible. So do you see what I'm saying? Like just little tweaks, just little tweaks in our thinking and, and little perspective changes and, and, and language changes. And um, the Lord has really been talking to me about be careful about your language. And catch yourself when you're in old language. Because if we see anything in Genesis, we see the power of the spoken word. We see the power of the word made flesh. Who was crucified before the foundations of the world were laid. We see the power of that to create. And so we've been continually while we're it's uh, like this. We're not trying to be double-minded, but transition is difficult. And I like what Mike Bickle <laughs> said years ago. Uh, years ago, he used to say, um, Nobody dangles gracefully, and that's the truth. And for those who are actually transitioning into the new era, for those who are actually like, Lord, we're with you, we are dangling, my friends. And it, it's awkward. But... I really want to charge you in this. It's awkward. But be diligent to, to catch, catch the language, to catch those little mindsets, and just realign with a place of union. We start just, you know, hooping and hollering and crying out for more. And the Lord is like, I engage with me. I'm right here. I don't even know where we're going now, guys. I started on a whole nother thing. Go back and listen to the first service, okay? You'll get the original thing. <clears throat> but we're just in such, such a good, good time to be alive. Such a good time to be alive. Oh, I just, I love it. I love the possibility. I love it. Oh, the chaos, the tohu wabohu just bubbling up. 
just like waiting for the word, just waiting for the sons, just waiting, like what are you going to create? I'll tell you what, we are going to create according to the pattern that he showed us on the mountain. And we are going to build on the cornerstones of joy and beauty and rest and Yeshua. Because there is a tried stone, there is a precious cornerstone that is laid in Zion. All right. I literally have no idea what I'm doing here. Um, but... Uh, what did we even talk about? How can I wrap this up? Sandy, come up here and help me out. <laughs> did Josh leave? Come on, help us out there. Yeah, we all need some help yeah, out. Yeah. <laughs> so, um... Over the weekend, there was a, a man that um, had a vision during worship that Elizabeth was leading. And um, unfortunately, I haven't had a chance to go back and listen to everything he said. But basically, he had a, um, a vision of being on an eagle. God had put him on an eagle, on an angel, pardon me. Uh, and there was an eagle involved with the, with the angel, but it was a seer angel. And that angel took him into the council of God. And, and <clears throat> so I, I was just stunned because it's a, it's a, um, a conversation that, you know, Patty and, and Elizabeth and I have had and other people. Um, there is a place called the council of God and God wants us in there. And that's, I think, where he's part of where he's drawing is that we have to stop kind of thinking, oh, I can figure this out on my own or or something comes up and, oh, I know how to pray for that, because we really don't anymore. We Just with everything that's, we just really don't. And so, but many of us have things that the Lord has given us over the years. To, you know, that's my thing I pray for, and that's awesome. But sometimes that's not what God is saying. Uh, especially as we get into a lot of groups. Um, uh, I gave the example of the women of the golden uh, candlestick, those women prayed for many, many years together. Wonderful things. Angels filled the room. Glory filled the room. They were transported to places. But if they didn't have the heart of God, uh, the woman that led the Francis Medcalf, if they got together and they didn't have the heart of God for what they were supposed to pray for that day, and they all came with, you know, I can pray for this, and they and they were big. Uh, they prayed for countries, and they they. They changed and, and shifted, I think, many countries um, as God translocated them into places. But if they didn't have that one heart of God when they came together, then they just worshipped for three or four or five hours, and then they went home. Because they didn't, it, basically, if they didn't have the, the strategy for that day or the blueprint for that day. And I believe that what that vision that that uh, Pastor Don, they called him, he, was he with you, Grant? Um, that's where the, the invite was from the Lord for us. That that eagle took him to a place where he could see the future, he could see a strategy, he could enter the counsel of the Lord. And I really believe that because that was spoken here in this house, it just because it was a Renko conference doesn't mean it was just for Renko. It was spoken in this room, in this house. And I asked the Lord, can do we... Do we release that again? Do we? And I, I yes, it's for actually it's for everybody, you know, because God's not real super exclusive, and um, and so I just want to release that. Pray. How many of you were here? I I forget now. How many of you were here during the conference? Okay, so there were a lot of you that weren't, and so if you want to, I don't, I'm not going to make you do anything, but let's uh, you can open your hands, open your heart. We're just going to acknowledge, I just want to acknowledge what God has said. 
And we just thank you, Father, for what you have said, Lord, what you said in this room yesterday. We put weight on it, Lord. We value what you said. And so, God, even though I can't remember, Lord, the majority of it, I saw you take us into the council. I saw you invite us into your council. And, Lord, we say yes. We come. God, we'll ride upon the eagles. We'll, we'll go with the angels. Lord, we want to see the strategies. We want to see uh, the, de- the purposes. We want to see blueprints. Because, God, you have made us all part of this city that you are building. And, Lord, we just confess we don't know how to do this. And that's wonderful. <laughs> Because now we just lean on you. And we say, Lord, teach us. Send us teachers. Send us tutors. We lean on you, God. We lean on you. We say yes to you. We say yes, we'll be city builders. We say yes, we'll be mountain climbers. We say yes, Lord. We are those who will come under your government in this hour. Lord, that you're teaching us, first of all, to govern our own lives and then showing us how to govern in other places. So, Father, I just pray for everyone here that anything blocking them, anything that that they think would disqualify them today, Father, let that be broken. Let that be destroyed in their lives. Father, I speak legitimacy to everyone in this room. I thank you, Father, that we have a small part or if we have a big part, if we have a long part, or we a short part, that God, we'd be so satisfied, so satisfied, just knowing we've picked up that thing that you've asked us to do. So God, I just pray today, give us ears to hear, give us eyes to see, let our hearts understand. Teach us to go in and come out. Teach us to go up and come down. God, that we would not build from the earth up, that we would build from heaven down. And we thank you for that, Lord. The shift, Lord. The shift. We say yes to transition. We say yes to what you're doing. Even though we may not understand, we love you. We trust you. And we bless you today. I just want to do do something here today in this moment I want you to just connect and engage with Yeshua inside of you in that place of union that you're in him and he's in you And it's as simple as that. You know, we build that into the rhythm of our days and the rhythm of our thoughts and the rhythm of our heart. That I'm in him and he's in me. And you can do this all throughout the day. That's the practice of union. You don't need to cry out for more of him. You just need to engage with him. Engage in that place of union and let him take you. Let him take you even now into the councils. Let him take you now even into realms. Let him take you now even into engage with wisdom. Let him take you now. This is not an external thing. That there is no separation. But he is in you. And you are in him totally and completely. And even if by faith at times we're proclaiming that, just connect, 
Connect with your words. Connect with your heart. God doesn't call the qualified. He qualifies the called. And you are the called. We are the called. So, so many times we just don't feel like we have what it, age or education or failures. And we just wipe that away today because you are the called and he'll, he's qualifying us in everything that we're doing. We're being taught. We're being taught. Part of the, I think the, the shifting in our, t in our, th even our thinking is Jesus walked on this earth with the seven spirits of God on him leading him and guiding him. Why couldn't we? Why couldn't we walk that same way? When we need wisdom, when we need understanding, when we need might, when we need um, the Spirit of the Lord to come upon us. Actually, the Spirit of the Lord is within us. And so it's just saying, God, break away those things that I thought I knew. I, I had an experience a few years ago that I just said, God, here's everything I know, take it and sift through it. <laughs> when I was done, I had like nothing left. <laughs> it was just nothing left because God takes us from glory to glory. And then there's also a present truth that he wants to take us, that he, he is releasing. And so what is that present truth for you? What is it for the body? This isn't hard. This shouldn't be a labor. It should be a, a like a, it should be a restful place of just, it's just going to take time. It's going to take a little bit more time than we're used to of just sitting before the Lord, learning how to quiet ourselves a bit. That's hard for all of us. But just saying, God, I, I want everything that was said there. I want to understand. Help me. And little by little, the Lord does come. The Lord does, whether it's through a teaching, whether it's through a conference you go to, whether uh, something pops up on your computer, and it's like, oh, yeah, there's a connection with that. So, um, so we, just, we just bless you today. We, we just thank you, Father. We thank you for Elizabeth this morning, Lord. God, and all that she carries and all that she is. And just, Lord, what she released, just fill her up. Just fill her up. Just f anything out, let it, let it all come back, God. We just thank you. Bless her, Lord. Bless your people, God. We just thank you, Father, that we are that new creation. We're a new species on earth. Let us understand that. Let us understand that. Yeah, thank you, Jesus.